Tassa, Bagawato, Arahato, Sama, Sambudasa, Namo Tassa, Bagawato, Arahato, Sama, Sambudasa. Homage to him, the Holy One, the wisest one, the fully enlightened one. Sadu, sadu, sadu. See? <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's see. We are going to do Ganaka Mogalana tonight. Okay. And Ganaka Mogalana is an interesting character because he's a, he's an accountant. I mean, he's out there in a, he's not a king, he's not a statesman, not a high Brahmin, not a priest, not a wanderer. He's just an accountant. And um, he comes to discuss a question he has about, do all the monks get to Nibbana? And everybody wants to know that. Everybody's always asking, let's see what happens. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Soati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Megara's mother. And then the Brahman, Ganaka Mogalana, he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down on one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Godama, in this palace of Megara's mother, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is down to the last step of the staircase. Among these Brahmins too, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress, that is in study. Among archers, this can be seen as well. And among accountants like us who earn our living in accountancy, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress down to the last step of the staircase. That is in computation. For when we get an apprentice, the first thing we do is make him count one, one, two twos, three threes, four fours, five fives, six sixes, seven sevens, eight eights, nine nines, ten tens, then we make him count a hundred too. Now, is it also possible, Master Godama, to describe the gradual training, the gradual practice, and the gradual progress in this Dhamma and discipline? It is possible, Brahman, to describe a gradual training, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress in this Dhamma and discipline. Just as when a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt, he makes him used to work. So when Agata obtains a horse tamed, he first disciplines by saying, now when the brahmin the uh, when brahmin the bhikkhu is virtuous he then and he is seeing fear in the slightest fault and trains by undertaking the precepts, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, guard the doors of your sense faculties, and on seeing a form with the eye, do not grasp at its signs and features. And since you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint. Guard the eye faculty 
undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. That's what we mean by guarding the guy, the eye faculty. We don't mean stop seeing, but we do mean stop attempting to grasp and hold on to whatever is seen. So we have perfect permission to see and perfect permission to smell a beautiful flower or to hear a beautiful sound or to taste a flavor with the tongue or touching a tangible with the body on cognizing the mind object with the mind. Do not grasp at its signs and features is the key to the teaching. Since if you were to leave the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states might invade you, practice the way of its restraint and guard the mind faculty, undertake the restraint of the mind faculty. So what's it mean? Stop letting the mind run around as a monkey mind. Bring in the mind so that it learns to stay in the present time. Train the mind to, at the slightest intention that you have, let go, relax, smile, and come back to whatever you're doing. And when the bhikkhu guards the doors of his sense faculties, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, and be moderate in eating. Reflect wisely that you should take food neither for amusement nor for the intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only take it for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending discomfort, for assisting the holy life. Considering this, I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. So basically what we're taught about eating when we're trying to eat food is for support for the body and the mind and not to fast and cut ourselves away. I don't know if you know this, but if someone comes to our center and they're fasting, we won't let them stay. They have to be doing it under the supervision of Bonte if we have to know about it. But if they come and we find out they're fasting and they're not eating or they're depriving themselves of sleep and they have a low progress level and we know they're starving their sleep, practicing a sleep depredation thing, we won't let them stay because it's ignoring the fact that the Buddha gave all of these things up. And at that point, he was able to go through. It's ignoring the fact of, of uh, depriving yourself to the extreme where it affects the body. The only way he could go through was with a sound mind and a sound body and good sleep, amount of good sleep. Now, what is true is that as you practice, when you're practicing steadily, you don't need a lot of sleep. Now that can keep going when you're older or can slow down when you're older, depends on what all you're trying to do when you're older. But my sleep reduced from 10 hours a day ordered by some doctors after I had a stroke and everything. They said, you're gonna have to be sleeping 10 hours a day. And I ended up on about five hours a day it was perfect for me. And then as I got older, because I was so busy, you know, working with Dhamma with all, a lot of different aspects, I got, so I needed seven hours again. So that's about where I would say my level point is now. But if I got to go away by myself uninterrupted and was able to do retreat, probably I I could go back down to like four or five hours pretty easily. It's basically for energy. Come, monk, and be devoted to wakefulness. 
during the day while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. In the first watch of the night, while walking back and forth, sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. And in the middle watch of the night, you should lie down on the right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware. After noting in your mind the time for your arising, there you hear the um, determination before you go to bed. He's talking about the determination. Lie on your side, determine what time you're going to wake up and then say, go to sleep and go to sleep. Your mind will obey you once you get your communication going. After rising in the third watch of the night, while waking, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. To purify your mind of obstructive states means basically to be practicing right striving. Right striving is the same as right effort. And I think I may have told you, I finally got this straightened out. When you look at the um, 37 requisites of enlightenment, you have faculties and you have powers. The only difference between faculties and five powers is that five powers are automatic and we don't have to think about them happening. The five faculties, the faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, we had to pay attention to where they were like this and keep balancing them. But to fulfill the five powers is to surrender yourself to the automatic balancing and your mind just goes on automatic and then they're called five powers. Well, what I found out recently was that the reason uh, in the exact same paragraph is appearing throughout the text concerning the description for right effort or for right striving is because of the same reason. So when you're starting out and this makes perfect sense to me that there's another expression for right effort once it goes automatic, because I saw my students go through this, many of them calling me approximately one and a half to two months of doing the practice every day, all the time in life. And then it flipped to automatic and they contacted me and said, what is this? And I said, you just flipped to automatic, but I didn't know there was another term. I didn't, wasn't sure what was happening. Someone had told me before that um, Nanamoli had liked the terminology of right striving. And someone told me that Bhikkhu Bodhi preferred to keep everything as right effort. But then we see in a couple of different suttas there is a different term so in that sutta if we go back to it it's an advanced sutta and we know that it fits for them to be saying right striving because probably everybody has it on automatic that's that's about when brahman the bhikkhu is devoted to his wakefulness then the tathagata disciplines him further Come monks and be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. So your observation with full awareness, okay? Act in full awareness when going forward and returning. Act in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. Act in full awareness when flexing and extending your limbs. Act in full awareness when wearing your robes and carrying your outer robe and bowl, act in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, act in full awareness when defecating and urinating, act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking, talking and keeping silent. Now, 
the question that always comes up is full awareness of what? Because the sentence, why am I saying that? Because the sentence is saying and is translated uniformly in all places the same way. It's saying act in full awareness when going forward and returning. It doesn't say act in full awareness on going forward and returning. So when you're walking, there's nothing that indicates that you are supposed to be only watching your feet. So what could it mean? And when we looked at this, we said, what is your mind doing? Now read it again. What is your mind doing when you are moving forward and returning? When you are looking ahead or looking away, what is your mind doing? Are you fully aware of what's in going on in your mind when you're flexing and extending your limbs, wearing your robes and carrying your outer, outer robe and bowl, are you? So that's it, the, the, whole concept, uh, the whole concept of the meditation is revolving around uh, the command control center, the brain, the mind, okay? So what is your mind doing when you do this or when, are, when you are, um, acting or moving in any way, doing anything, eating or anything. So what we see is this is all changed. This is one of the things I call the slippages, okay? We can do that someday. There's a whole folder in there full of 52 slip, slippages or something like that. And one of the slippages is I'm eating. So I'm going to watch my fork and go like this and go like that and stare at it and concentrate on it and put it in my mouth and go like this and go like that. And I'm gonna do that as a practice, except it's not one of the Dutangas that's listed. There are the Dutangas for the monks to practice like sitting um, and standing, but never lying down or um, only eating in your bowl. Oh, there's, how many are there, Bhante? Do you remember? Or there's nine or 11 of them, I think. Um, of the Dutangas. 11, 11 Dutangas. 11 Dutangas. And they choose one and they do it. Okay, you're on each where you, um, you never lie down. So you sit by a wall, but you can never lie down to sleep. And you can sit or you can stand and walk. Okay, but you cannot lie down. And he went six months like that. But this is not one of the Dutangas. This is kind of, they had Dutangas. So why don't we do something like this? And they started doing this. So people would start doing that. And the same thing happened with the, um, the um, I tried to figure this out. I tried to investigate why you would put so much emphasis on your foot and count the number of positions in your foot where it's rising and you're putting it down and rolling the foot and onto the ball and lifting the foot and swinging it over. And they get up into the thousands of like positions that you can watch this happening in slow motion in your mind, it's clicking like frames in a movie of it happening. But then my question was, why are you doing this? And when I went to these teachers and asked them they told me that it was very important for the sake of deeply understanding Anicca. And I, I couldn't get it <laughs> because I live in the forest. And for me, just to take a walk through the forest to deeply understand Anicca was a very easy thing. If you go into a national park and for the day and walk a trail in the forest and just consider everything that's there, from the seed to the sprout, to the little thing coming out of the ground, to the tiny sapling, to the mid-sized tree, to the big tree, to the giant tree that got cut down and fell on the ground and then over 20 years disintegrated and there's nothing in one spot on our mountain. I can show you where there is this shadow left of the disintegration of a whole entire tree that just, there's nothing there but you can, you know, evidence, it's almost seeing like the color in the ground, there was a tree here at one point. So this is the whole story of Anicca on one walk in the forest. And I don't see, um, 
I still haven't gotten a legitimate answer from anybody about why we would do something like that with the walking when the most important thing for your meditation turns out to be the importance of good circulation when you're sitting. And if your circulation is not good when you're sitting, not and if you if this all if you really want to go down the path, that's what you really want to do, and you want to see how far this goes. Well, it's not going to happen, you know, unless you have a really good circulation in your body and a healthy body when you do go after that, you see. And so you want to keep your circulation up so your walking becomes very important in between your sittings. If you want to see sloth and torpor, a big rate of sloth and torpor happening in a group, you go where all they do is sit for that hour and they can't move until they ring a bell and some of them are sitting there and they finish their sitting but they can't get up and leave. And then they're told, it's all dictated when to walk, when to sit, when to walk, when to sit. And remember what I told you about this, the science has proven now how you train your mind. And the way that you train your mind is impingement, doing something the same way. The neuroplasticity and all of this about the changing, being able to change uh, the brain to another set of habits. Well, if you had a habit of getting up at one hour, I uh, have a student presently in the retreat who was practicing where it wasn't that she was with a group of people, it's that for many years, she was setting the clock and sitting for an hour and coming out. It's understandable in this day and time because we try to find a time to sit, but the problem for her is now she is definitely ready to sit three hours or two or three hours easily. She just has to cross the line of understanding about time that time is insignificant. It, it is, doesn't exist. There's no difference in sitting half hour and three hours. But because you believe there's a difference, that's part of the problem of breaking through to longer sitting. But you need the longer sitting in order to get to the place where you can, the conditions are right for falling into neither perception or non-perception and again into cessation. It's very important. So the walking is important to keep your circulation up and, and that sort of thing. So now the next one is when Brahman, the bhikkhu possesses mindfulness and full awareness. This is observation, skilled observation with full awareness. Then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come monk, resort to a secluded resting place the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, or a heap of straw. You know, two of us at the center once decided to do all of that. <laughs> we went to find a solid heap of straw to climb up and sit on. We managed to do that with the blanket for a couple of days. We went to an open space in a field we went to uh, into the forest and sat on, up on like big rocks, sat on, on big rocks and uh, we can't go to a charnel ground. The only charnel ground I know about, now maybe we can do it here in India, it's possible we can, but when we went to Bali, the retreat center there had a big lake and there was a Hindu village where there was an active charnel ground. So what is a charnel ground? It's where you take the person, the body before cremation, they wrap them up and lay them um, on a pad, like a, a concrete pad sometimes in the open wrapped up and, and the body is just there wrapped up. And no, there are no relatives, there's nobody claiming the body oftentimes, and they wait until there's enough. I'm not sure what's going on here. I think um, maybe uh, Major can straighten me out on this, but the one that I saw, I think they were waiting for enough water in the river next to it before they were going to do anything in the, in the 
uh, the service for the cremation of the body, um, and then and then let the ashes go into the river. I'm not sure about that, but um, that charnel ground was active, and some of the people actually hiked over there to visit that to see that. A hillside cave really means climbing up the side of a mountain. It can be a cave or it can be a cliff overhang. We have a nice cliff overhang. You can climb up and go under and stay out of the rain. The ground is coming down and you can go under it. You just have to check who else is going under it <laughs> before you decide to stay in there and, and meditate. Make sure there isn't an, any other occupant in there. And a ravine in Missouri is not recommended because in the ravines are like, there's a, there's a, um, a ridge top and there's, it's going down very steep like this. And there's another ridge top over here and it goes down into a ravine and the water when it rains goes down in there. The other problem with that is if you're clearing the timber so you can have a view or something and the trees fall down in there, it's not advisable to go down into the ravine because the rattlesnakes like to be there and you, you don't want to go down in there. A mountain is easy and a tree, the root of a tree. I also prefer, we made tree stands and put the tree stands roped the tree stands up off the ground three or four feet and climbed into tree stands where we had a, a, a tree that was growing like with three pieces like this. And they were fun to put the mosquito net on and stay all day over there. So he resorts to a re secluded resting place and on returning from his alms round after his meal, he sits down and folding his legs crosswise setting his body erect, establishing mindfulness, and then abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness by practicing the steps that we're using in right effort, okay? Abandoning ill will, hatred, he abides with a mind free of ill will compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. That's why you're fulfilling this because you're using metta and compassion. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred, abandoning sloth and torpor. He abides free from sloth and torpor, percipient of light, Mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. So basically, this is a practice of six Ring and letting everything go. If you saw my book, you'd see abandoning, 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 abandoning. We need a song. We need a song for this one. So abandoning restless and remor restlessness and remorse. He abides unagitated. So this sounds like four, number four, doesn't it? So it's, it's uh, if you remember the uh, Baya Barawa Sutta, um, I think it's number four. This, the whole thing was based on 16 um, opposites, you see? So he's, once again, he's taking the theme of the solution for the hindrance in this one, in these two paragraphs, he's talking about taking it to the opposite, okay? Um, and then abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides, having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. I cannot tell you how many people have told us as we're teaching them, just aga, you know, just out of so surprised that they, they come out of this 
totally amazed that they have abandoned all their doubt that there was a practice, a real practice that the Buddha found. And they, they experience, even to experience first jhana with uplifted joy and are really clearly experience that you will verify the fact there must have been something that really did happen. And that all that doubt falls away. And because you experienced it, meaning you're not such a poor meditator that you can't experience it. One of the saddest things I ever saw was when there were 40 people in a retreat once in Arizona. We were um, there also. And um, Bunty was there and I was and three other students of Bunty's. And we were there because we had a small conference before it. So we stayed for that retreat. And um, they were teaching jhana was the way they were talking about it. And the one person was very upset because she kept coming every night and but when will I be able to because everyone else is experiencing but when will I be able to and I felt so sorry for her because the teacher gave in and said right out loud well you know some people they're just not going to experience this they just can't do it it's just not for them and it was heartbreaking to hear somebody say that because we knew that much of what was going on was just back off, be calm, be quiet, be patient, and just never mind everything and abandon it. And in the quiet, that's where your uplifted joy will come. That is where it will come. That's the marker for the first jhana. So having thus abandoned these five hindrances, in perfection of the, of the mind, that weakened wisdom, quite secluded from central pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he entered upon and abided in the first jhana. But I and with the stilling of this thinking and examining thought, he entered upon and abided in the second jhana. Now you watch how a new piece comes in, which has self-confidence and a singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought. So the thought is slowing down and the confidence and singleness of purpose being quiet, backing off letting go of me farther, farther, farther away with joy and happiness born of concentration, born of a productive concentration, reaching a level of productive concentration level or collectedness of mind. With the fading away as well of this joy, he abides in equanimity and the equanimity is strong enough at that point to, to um, notice there's equanimity. There is equanimity in the first and the second jhana. When the third one comes up, it becomes closer to really realizing there's this difference in the way things affect you when you make contact. Mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. So he's still able, to, he's still feeling his body and, but he's sitting in that quiet part there in the third jhana on. And for us, it means that you're practicing with the metta and it's slipping up into uh, starting to uh, get ready to move up into your head. And it's getting ready at this point for you to start losing the part, losing the feeling in the body. Okay. On account of which noble ones will announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful, able to observe with enough balance that any noise or motion or vibration is not going to disturb him. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he enters upon and he abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure. 
and purity of mindfulness that is due to equanimity. So his mindfulness, when it says purity of mindfulness, just say purity of observation means you're turning up to a higher strength of lens for observation and things are getting much clearer. Not being but seeing things more clearly. It's my instructor, and those monks who are higher training, whose minds have not yet attained the goal, uh, who abide aspiring to the supreme security from the bondage. But these things conduce both to a pleasant abiding here and now and to mindfulness and full awareness for those monks who are arahants with taint destroyed, who have lived the holy life and done what had to be done. And they laid down the burden and reached their own goal. They destroyed the fetters of being and they're completely liberated with final knowledge here and now. So what is this, this one saying basically? Well, it's saying to you, my instruction to the uh, to these monks who are in the higher training, their minds have not attained the goals. So they are not through. But these things conduce both to the pleasant abiding here and now and to mindfulness and full awareness for those um, monks who are arahats with taints destroyed. So the ar so arahats whose taints are destroyed are having a very pleasant abiding here and now and their observation and full awareness, they're enjoying it in life by appreciating it. They're very comfortable, it's a sweet abiding. And the arahats who are taint, with taints totally destroyed, who have lived the holy life, those the arahats that have gone all the way through, they've destroyed the fetters of being and completely liberated through the final knowledge here and now. So when this was said, the Brahmin Ganika Mogalana asked the Blessed One, when Master Gotama's disciples are thus advised and instructed by him, do they all reach Nibbana, the ultimate goal, or do some of them not attain it? When Brahman, they are thus advised and instructed by me, some of my disciples attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. Master Gotama, since Nibbana exists and the path leading to Nibbana exists and Master Gotama is present, as the guide, what is the cause and the reason why when Master Gotama's disciples are thus advised and instructed by him that some of them attain Nibbana and the ultimate goal is reached and some do not attain it? As to that, Brahman, I will ask you a question in return. Answer it as you choose. What do you think, Brahman? Are you familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha? Yes, Master Gotama, I am familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha. Well, what do you think, Brahman? Suppose a man who wanted to go to Rajagaha and he approached you and he said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. And then you told him, now good man, this road goes to Rajagaha. Follow it for a while and you will see a certain village. Go a little further and you will see a certain town. Go a little further and you will see Rajagaha and its lovely parks and groves and meadows and ponds. Then having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would take a wrong road and he would go to the west. But then a second man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha 
and he, and he approached you and he said, venerable sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Will you show me the road to Rajagaha? And so you told him, now good man, this road goes to Rajagaha in the same way you told him how to follow it for a while. And if you did, if he did, he would see Rajagaha with its lovely parks and groves and meadows and ponds. And then having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would arrive safely in Rajagaha. Now, Brahmin, since Rajagaha exists and the path leading to Rajagaha exists and you were present as the guide, what is the cause and reason why when those men have been thus advised and instructed by you, one man takes a wrong road, goes to the West, one arrives safely in Rajagaha. And boy, as teachers, do we know this one. <laughs> You know, what can I do about that, Master Godama? I am one who shows the way too. So too, Brahman, Nibbana exists and the path leading to Nibbana exists and I am present as a guide. And yet many of my disciples have been thus advised and instructed by me and some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some of them do not attain it. What can I do about that, Brahman? The Tathagata is one who shows the way. When this was said, the Brahman Ganaka Mogalana said to the Blessed One, but seeking a livelihood. Those who are fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, and personally vain. Some are rough-tongued, loose-spoken, unguarded in their sense faculties, immoderate in eating, and undevoted to wakefulness, unconcerned with their reclusion, not great respectful of training, luxurious, careless, Leaders in backsliding, neglectful of seclusion, lazy, wanting in energy, unmindful, not fully aware, uncollected in their minds, having straying minds, devoid of wisdom, who are drivelers. Master Gotama does not dwell together with these. But there are clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, who are not fraudulent. They are not deceitful and treacherous and haughty and hollow. They're not personally vain, rough-tongued or loose-spoken. They are guarded in their sense faculties, moderate in their eating, devoted in their wakefulness, concerned with reclusion, greatly respectful of training, not luxurious, or careless who are keen to avoid backsliding. They are leaders in seclusion, energetic, resolute, established in their observation mindfulness, fully aware, concentrated with unified minds, possessing wisdom and not dribblers. Master Gotama dwells together with these. Just as the black orris root is reckoned as the best of root perfumes and the red sandalwood is reckoned as the best of the wood perfumes and the jasmine is reckoned as the best of the flower perfumes, so too Master Gotama's advice is supreme among the teachings of today. And then you've got to love the ending of the sutta. It's very standard. It's marvelous. Magnificent, Master Godama. Magnificent, Master Godama. Master Godama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright what had been turned overturned. Revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, holding up a lamp in the dark, for those who have eyesight to see the forms. I go to Master Godama 
for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let Master Godama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So they all do arrive if they follow the instructions. That's the one, isn't it? Yesterday, I had um, a few people here and we got into a little discussion about, you know, what happened to this information that we're teaching? Hard to say, isn't it, with 2,600 years between us and it, <laughs> you know? But um, when I started talking about the things that flipped over across time to something else, they were just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, exactly. Two of them were teenagers. And when they came in, they really didn't want to hear much, you know. But then when we started talking about that and talking, uh, if you touch the subject, even touch the subject of, um, we have to be able to give the Dhamma to someone to take it home with them and use it to make a difference in their life. Then the person will start to believe on their own that there was actually something to discover that the Buddha found and he did find an answer. There's a tremendous amount of people in Buddhism who don't really know what he did or what he found. And in some places, sometimes you go in a country where you uh, ask somebody, what is the gift the Buddha left for us? What is it? And you, you don't find the gift. You hear about, he taught suffering. <laughs> and you want the rest of it. He taught suffering and the cessation of suffering. You see, I got very excited when I had just two suttas that said there was an escape. He, he did find the escape and the word was there. And the other one was he did find the antidote, you see. So the word escape happens in 148. In Chachaka Sutta, the origination, you, the, what you're supposed to try to see in order to be able, in your meditation, you're supposed to be seeing something. You're supposed to be watching the function and, and the control center operation. You're trying to, uh, the command center being here for everything, for the entire body. He takes you to the highest form, which is examining and investigating the mind. And when you learn, everything is coming from there. Even if you have an idea and an intention, you start here with an intention, then the thought, then you put it out verbally or physically do it and action takes place, you see? So it, it's such a logical thing to go back to the source to, to stop the craving, but you, you, so tricky. All this is tricky terrain. You cannot stop the craving unless you know what it is and how it arises. Otherwise you can't let go of it. That's the beauty of Bhante teaching it this way. He's telling you um, the symptoms we don't have to go to the doctor, spend all day, have diagnostic tests until we're exhausted to find out the symptom because he's telling you the symptom and it's right there in the texts in the form of, I like it, I want it, attachment, or I don't like it, I don't want it and resisting. And then I have to make it stop, see? I made Bonte laugh once because I went running to his cootie, knocked on the door and said, I discovered something. He said, what? I said, I discovered that there's attachment in aversion. <laughs> he started laughing and he just went, yeah. 
And he walked away. He, you know, he waited for me to find out that there was attachment in aversion. Because when you say, look at any situation that you get into and you don't like the situation. So when you don't like it, when people are arguing and you walk into a room and you get sucked into that situation, what happens is you get attached to the idea, I have to leave or I have to stop this or I have to change it somehow. And you get emotionally committed to making it stop. But you can just let it go and change it. And some of you have been telling me stories now. It's really fun. I didn't interrupt this discussion these people were having, you might say, or when they were disputing it and debating it in a hot way, I changed the topic and shifted the direction of the room. And then the whole thing melted away and everything stopped, see? So anyway, the escape is when we're watching, we're trying to see of the phenomena, how the phenomena arises and you want to know how it arises, originates and how it disappears and how you get involved with it. That's gratification is the word they use. Start enjoying it or get involved with it. The danger of that. And when you boil down what the danger of that is, at the bottom, the most important point at the bottom is you get pulled away from present time. You can't stay in present time. And we don't say present moment, remember that. We don't say present moment. <laughs> it's like, I'm waiting for somebody to say present nanosecond. <laughs> You can't stay in the nanosecond or the moment or the second or the minute. You can't stay anywhere. You're always moving, you see? So the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the, there it is, the escape. The escape. He said it. He wants you to understand all of that and the escape. And he lays out the groundwork for you in the sutta to take you away from anat atta from atta to the anatta to the impersonal perspective and when you need to calm the room down you stop taking everything personally look at what's actually going on essentially going on and see the opening for you to change the topic to something they really want to talk about you know, all the time, but nobody listens. Just flip it. And then it all stops. And they start talking about a happier thing. So it is the escape. So the antidote is the one that I told you about before in uh, Angutra Nikaya uh, in the Book of Threes. I think it's 125. I do not teach you a dhamma without a basis. I do not teach you a dhamma without knowledge. I do not teach you a dhamma that is antidotal, where there's no antidote. He says, I teach a dhamma with a basis, which we've talked about, the basis, the construct of the information you need to have to understand the sutta the way we understood it, for instance. I teach a basis, I teach a set of knowledge. The knowledge you're teaching is how everything actually works, how the, the natural way everything actually works and including the seven links of dependent origination that are happening in everything that occurs and watching that film happen. The more you watch it, the more you understand it's very real and you can start seeing it in everywhere and everything. I watch the two dogs out here in the morning. They, I can see it very clearly <laughs> in the two dogs. And then I, I teach a Dhamma that has an antidote. 
there it is. I teach a Dharma that has the antidote. And the antidote is the Samawayama, is that practice supported by the other seven parts of the Eightfold Path. And you keep doing it and you change your mind. And when you change your mind, you change your life and you start smiling more. So how about questions? Anybody have any questions? This has brought to the surface for you. Any questions? Hmm? There is a lot of this, this Sutta of today. It, there is a lot to sort of like break apart because it, it comes with the perspective of someone who's not in the in the necessarily in the Sangha, right? This 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 monk is um, this is not a monk. This is a merchant, right? Right. And 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 it's, it's and it's trying to describe that the tra- and it's trying to describe the training, you know, like likening the training from a monk to somebody who does who does something different. Um, I, I don't know. For me, it's like I'm maybe I'm overthinking a little bit because um, I'm 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 comparing this to to the practice for, for this week because we're in retreat right now, so I'm trying to like figure out where I fit in all that. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't I don't even really have the like the right words to formulate the question because it's is um, uh, you know after a certain place you you wonder you know how that how does the hindrance originate you know. So that's 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 where I am where I'm with this. When is that clear? The hindrances come from broken precepts in the past or broken precepts in the present. And the precepts act as an umbrella to protect you from the hindrances attacking you. You see? Now, if something shows up that starts occurring, you're keeping your precepts very well and then something starts happening in your practice, it can come from before, from from before meaning in this lifetime or in another lifetime, it can creep in like a phobia or something that starts happening where you have a fear come up you've never had in your life before. I've told you about that before. And um, The hindrances show up in all different ways. It's not confined to just the five hindrances that he was talking about. If we go, if we go to 128, to the Upakalesa Sutta, we are dealing with 11 different sutta, different hindrances. And if we go back to number four, Um, one person was talking to me about I've been so full of doubt and the doubt the doubt we're talking about in the hindrances doubt the, the damaging one is I just have doubt about the way I'm practicing if I'm doing it right or if this is really it and you get in there with that and look how many other people say this and other people say that but we tell you in this pre- in this uh, school that we're working with basically that you're not supposed to just believe us. Everything we tell you is based on you something you should be able to see if you're following the instructions. And one man was here today. You know, he he was saying, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you know, don't you think other people are following the instructions?" I said, "You tell me." You tell me if there's if there's a, something out there and that's teaching, but there are no sotapanas and sakadagamis and anagamis that are happening. Well, then we have to wonder why is that when in the text consistently having it sound so positive that these things can happen if you follow the instructions. So he says, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you have a car. You drove a car here today." He said, "Yes." I said, if your car was broken, are you gonna keep, you have a choice. Are you gonna go fix your car or are you going to drive the car until the car collapses? We actually did that with an old truck on the mountain once. (laughs) We drove it until it just fell apart and it fell down on the ground. We weren't on the road, it was just great. (laughs) 
And so we drove it till it just fell apart. And of course, anybody who has a car today is going to tell you that they want to go and fix that car. So how do you fix the car? You have to find out what is, is not set quite right or tuned just right so that the car doesn't do what it says it was going to do when you bought the car. And so we're playing this game of practicing and seeing whether these instructions, the way that they've been retuned, whether is that why they're working so well, but it's for you to do it, for you to figure it out. I can tell you the definition for meditation, for mindfulness, for craving, for, uh, the, for, the, uh, for the craving and the clinging and talk to you about the seven factors of enlightenment and the, 30, uh, the 32 requisites. I can show you 37 requisites. Uh, I can explain all that, but you have to apply it and see if it, it really works or not. The hindrances though, don't get too hung up about them because remember a couple things about them. I know it's tricky because the hindrance is a teacher, but the hindrance is also it can point for you where your craving is coming from. You can figure that out. Yeah. But most of the time, the way to look at the hindrance is the way it's expressed in all of the suttas. It doesn't have, hold any real information that is going to say, this is the way to Nibbana. Here is the sign. Follow me. It isn't like that. It isn't going to solve that. So you, the message is purely abandon, relinquish, let it go, release it. Re, don't feed it any attention. The, the uh, most important one to remember in your head is 22, where he basically says, whenever an obstacle arises, the only way it can become an obstruction is when you indulge in it or engage it. Those Bonte likes indulge. The text was translated, engage it. If you engage it in any way, so then the student will say to you, well, what does engage mean? <laughs> Mention it, define it, look it up, go back in history, find out who it is or what. No, no, it don't. you don't engage it at all. You're on the horse on the side of the mountain, and here's the other army over here, and, the, and the, they're going to go down and have an a big fight in the valley. And this one is saying, hold, do not engage. It means don't move your horse. Don't even dare move your horse at all until they tell you when to engage, you see? So that's where engage is. Indulge is thinking about it. Don't even go there. Because the primary message in all of the suttas when we boil them down, even number four, which is basically laid out as they are having trouble when they go in the jungle because they're afraid. So I go in unafraid. You see, that's how that one was set up. But what does that mean when he goes in unafraid? He makes a determination to go in without fear. He has abandoned fear. So the message, once again, it comes down to this point at the bottom. And at the bottom, when we do the deductive reasoning, it comes out to abandoning the hindrance. So the, you need to put in your head, no matter what it is, abandon it, let it go by. I can deal with it when I come out of my meditation. Just abandon, abandon. You get it? Yeah? Yes, Mother I have a question. Yeah. Yes, Umar, hi. Yes. Um, so about uh, the Brahma Viharas sending metta to yourself by starting it. So where do the uh, directive thought and evaluation fit into this? I mean, if you are sending metta to yourself, that is, uh, I guess, that is directive thought and you're evaluating just how good it is, whether you're on the object or you're distracted and that's uh, Vitaka evaluation. Is that correct? You're getting too you're getting too entwined without the actual meaning. Okay. 
The reason we send metta for 10 minutes to yourself for about three sittings and that's all is because if you don't have something, you can't give it to someone else. And the primary problem we have in the world today is a lot of people running around on the earth who don't like themselves. Many so, of them dislike themselves. So a so person the, who dislikes the point, Umer, the point is, if a person dislikes themselves, they cannot send it to another person. That's why the only reason we send it to ourselves, we're very clear when we're doing it. We're not, there are, I will tell you the truth. I have maybe in 20 years, I've had two or three students, that's all I can remember, who got so wrapped up that they were sending it to themselves and it felt so good. They weren't, they never did want to send it to anyone else. And that's incorrect, isn't it? That's incorrect understanding. And it's my error. I didn't explain it well enough to them to get the point across to them. The only reason that you're sending it to yourself is that you need to fill it yourself up with meta before you can give it to someone else. That's all. That's all it is. Okay. Right. Yes. But my question was, um, you're sending it to yourself, but you're also, uh, you, you also haven't figured out the, the meaning of uh, Vitaka and Vichara, directed thought and evaluation. So how, how does that work? Because you said Samatha Vitaka and Vipassana work together. Vitaka and Vichara are, if you want to see how they are working in relationship to mental proliferation, it's Vitaka, Vichara, Papancha, Sankara. There you go. That's how it works. So if you get involved in thinking that you have to look at every thought and expand it and figure out what it is, and then you have runaway thinking from there, you're actually talking almost like contact and then craving and then clinging. And clinging is equal to uh, mental proliferation, upadana, okay? And you don't, you don't want to go there. So you just, you just keep watching. So don't obsess about Vitaka and Vichara when it comes up in a sutta. Don't obsess on it as any kind of law or something you have to do, do or get involved in too much. You get what I mean? Yes, but there is one more question about this because yeah. in, in the suttas there, the Buddha presents similes for all the jhanas and how to get there. He says that in the first jhana, there is the simile of uh, Batman's apprentice uh, making dough soap of soap water in the basin and then rubbing it all over the body, saturating the entire body, not even a part of it. It's not saturated with the, with, with the rapture and pleasure bond of seclusion. So what is that? Is that not direct to thought and evaluation and uh, doing the work that the cause and the result is the pleasure and the rapture? Uh, do you like the pleasure and the rapture in your, in your, like it a lot in your practice? Do you? Well, they haven't developed, so I cannot say what they are so far. But that way, right? I couldn't hear what you said. Your voice was breaking up. Okay, I'm sorry. We, I'm sorry, cutting in and out. Like what I'm saying is, if you know that, that there is that kind of description and everything. Do you think that that's really cool? And if I could get there, that'd be really a release from the world. And I would really like to be there. That would feel really good, huh? Right? Yes. That's the problem right there. <laughs> that's the problem. See, without enough understanding about this, the first time you hit uplifted joy, and then you really, we, we had one uh, famous story. She's she died a number of years ago, but she's one of our early students and she was really sweet, but boy, she liked joy so much. And joy happens in the first jhana and joy is there in the second jhana. And you know what happens in the third jhana? Joy is not there anymore. And she would come in and say, we would say, how do you feel? Well, I feel, I feel quiet and very calm and, and um, well, then what's wrong? There's no joy. I want my joy back. Joy was really, really nice. And, and, and we went on like this for almost a half a year with this person, 
trying to get that person to let go because everything is changing and Anicca is affecting everything. Anicca is absolutely everything is arising, is there and passes away. You need to go to 111 and you need to read it very carefully how these things work. Because if you see in each one of those jhanas, there's something it's experiencing. If there's a consistent that's in there, this was not here, it arose, it is here, and it passes away. Everything that happens to you in your life, everything, everything, you see? So when, one of the dangers is when we are in a situation, there's any number of reasons why this happens, but there, people come to meditation for all different reasons and they use it for all different kinds of solutions. But if they want to go on path, the way to keep themselves from ever succeeding is by really liking what happens in the practice as it's going along. Because if you're really curious about getting to the end of the path and seeing what an experience, experiencing an experience of no experience and what would happen to your brain if that was true. Think about that for a second. That's where I got about five years into this. I said, you know, uh, Godemo was actually trying to, if he was trying to do anything, he was attempting to, um, experience an experience of no experience. And why would he be trying to do that? Because from because the Rupa Hindus Jhana, at the time. No, 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 listen carefully because in the Rupa Jhanas, you see this, this can go on to a certain point, but in the Arupa Jhanas, okay, if you're doing it to enjoy it, to feel it and escape the world and try to get somewhere, then that's a mistake. And you're right, the Hindu, the Hindu uh, that he was taught as a child was trying to go to something and become one with God, okay? And in Buddhism, that's not there. In Buddhism, if we say it's really about the potential of the brain, and the, when you talk to a neurologist sometime about the brain, he'll explain what happens to our thinking and the sharpness of our computing and everything is the pressure, amount of pressure that's on the brain. Okay. And so the Buddha was slowly discovering something. What happens if there's no pressure at all on the brain and what happens to this incredible machine, the brain, if there's no stress at all on it, and we become calm and equanimity in very firm equanimity, what becomes the potential of that brain? What becomes the potential of innovation? What becomes the potential of productivity or anything else? If we just come out and use the brain for something in the in the in the particular uh, new present time, and then we we relax it the rest. We have it. and the future. See, those two stresses are what are going like this to it constantly. What if they're not there anymore? It opens the, it raises the IQ of the person. We had some of our students were measuring their IQs and everybody was going much higher than we used to go, much higher. So when you look at that, <laughs> I don't like IQ tests, but you know, even me, I went higher, <laughs> you know, and some of these guys, they went much higher. And the, the woman that went back to New York after doing an online retreat with me, my goodness, she affected everybody in the office. She was the office manager. She affected all 15 of the women that were working in that office. All of them increased their productivity, stabilized their communication skills in the office, boosted and supported each other. And none of that had been going on before. And all that happened was their boss, only her. She took the initiative to take an online retreat 
And she came out of it much, much calmer. And look at how it affected everyone around her. But going back to your original question, the only reason that we send a meta to ourselves first is to be able to have it, it, know what it feels like, understand what you're giving to the other person. And then you can sense if that person is receiving it. How can you know if you don't have it yourself? Put a diamond in your hand. I put a diamond in one of my hands and say, you know, if I have this diamond in my hand, I can give it to you, but I can't give it to you if I don't have it. Get it? See? Okay, yes. So what is the purpose of the simile of the Batman's apprentice? What was he talking about there? Which sutta is this in and why are we discussing that sutta with this sutta? <laughs> Well, no, not about this sutta. I mean, this is the, uh, the question, uh, what is it? The, the question time. So that is why I'm bringing it up because it is about describing the first jhana. It is uh, the Batman's apprentice. I can look it up right now, but you might- so you what, what, what We're not minutes. talking about that sutta. Write me a note, send me what you what sutta number it is and which, where it is, okay? I'll go look at it. And I'll tell you, okay, I'll write you back. I'm very slow right now, though. Take it easy mm -hmm. on me, okay? Okay. <laughs> the reason I'm slow is because I, 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 <laughs> I experienced India <laughs> last week. <laughs> the car I was in went in a very big pothole and it, it maybe like dislocated my neck. So I had to go get work done on the neck and I was in a lot of pain for like two days. So it's all straightened out now because the ankle is connected to the shin bone and the shin bones connected to the thigh bone and all of me is reconnected and my hands are fine now and my wrists are fine, everything. Because I went to the Ayurvedic cure-all of the universe. I had him work on me and that was it, <laughs> I'm okay, yep. So everything is working okay now, but if you write me a note, I promise you, I will look at it, okay? But you're throwing me a curveball if you come and listen intently and give ear to the sutta and then ask me questions from a different sutta. That's stretching it, <laughs> okay? Okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at it right now. Okay, so, okay. So anybody else have a question about this one or what did it bring up for you? Hmm? Basically, sort of follow the instructions and, <laughs> and you'll get there. <laughs> That's the best one. Anybody else have a question? No? So we're, we're kind of about done. Bonte, do you need to tell anybody anything? Um, one thing is uh, regarding the, the Dutanga, there are 13 Dutangas. Uh, uh, so that is uh, not 11 or 9, but 13, 1, 3. So somebody pointed out to me. Dutanga practices. It is 13 Dutanga oh, practices. Oh, it's 13? Ascetic pra practices. Okay, 13. it's 13. Okay. I, I also maybe misremembered it as in heaven, but it is 13 practices. But uh, you can't do all the practices at one time. No. There are certain practices uh, which are multiple of the same category, like uh, housing. So you okay. stay in a, a house uh, which is uh, of the tree. One is in the open, one is in the, uh, you choose, you don't choose the house which you are staying in. So there are some kind of multiple things. Yeah, it was like for me, it was like sleep. So there are like, um, things. So uh, anybody you know, do as many as what you are. Yeah. Able to. Yeah, it was basically the the one I paid the most attention to with traveling with Bonte was to sleep wherever they put me, <laughs> and it was fascinating. <laughs> Just accepting totally, you know, accepting it like the, it's the king's bed, no matter where it is. I slept in the basement of um, the, the uh, Burmese. They let me in the building. Just that they let me in the building was a big deal. <laughs> you know, the monks 
Burmese uh, Vihara for the headquarters for the Burmese monks in the United States. And I got proud all these quilts and everything in the army cot in December next to this. And I'm falling asleep and thinking, this is really great. I'm thinking it's like wonderful. And I have my little water bottle next to me. And I look up on the shelf and there was a big rat. <laughs> he was sitting there like this. And the rat was there and I was there and it was fine. The rat was, I know about uh, rodents, you know, hamsters and uh, rabbits and things like that, even pet rats. And they just, if they're sitting there and they're washing their face like this, they're not, they're not afraid of anything and they're very happy. So I was sitting there watching him and smiling and saying, oh, you're happy, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and the other one that was fun was up in Seattle. Uh, the monks were in a really nice house and there was a big snowstorm. And um, they let me stay in the house instead of in the truck, like where I was sleeping in the truck in the summertime, but, I, um, I slept in the house, they put me in the basement, but this basement was really different. You know, this basement was a glass, in, glass wall around the computers in the basement and they printed all their material. The Thai temples are wonderful because they set themselves up the printing shop and they, they print all of their booklets and all of their pamphlets and advertising and everything. So that was right there. And then I was sleeping in a tiny little fenced in sort of area that was the library. And this was a really wonderful furnace. And that was in the winter time too, the following year, I think it was. And what was funny was my daughter called me up. I called, uh, called me up on the phone and she said, where are you? And I said, I'm sleeping in the basement in the library. <laughs> she said, mom, you're, you're 50 or you're 55 years old and you're sleeping in the basement. What's wrong with this? I said, nothing's wrong. There's high quality carpeting. And if I wake up, I can read anything I want. You know, <laughs> it's really funny. She was thinking one way and I was thinking you sleep wherever you're put. And another time we were in Jakarta, in, in uh, Malaysia, they took us to a bamboo village the monks had built, a bamboo construct. And you just got to sleep inside, uh, up off the ground. You climbed up into a little cabin about four feet off the ground and it was all totally bamboo. It was wonderful and very quiet, you know, cause you're in the jungle. So I said, you never know if, you, if you're not afraid or you're, or you're very content with wherever you are, you can have a really nice time. That's basically the reality. Sleep, yeah. So anyway, let's close this then. If anybody doesn't have any questions, okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and bonds of mighty, mighty thumb, may they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. My little bell gets indignant if it doesn't get hit. <laughs> okay, I'll Thank see you. Well. Yeah, how are you doing, Perel? Yeah? I'm doing good. Thank you, sister. Good, good. Okay, I see you next time. And next week, next week, bring people. We're going to do 148. We're going to take it all apart. So please come so you can see how that one was constructed. Okay. It'll be really fun. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sister. Thank you. Okay, then. I'll end this meeting for everybody. <laughs>